I brought my Bible. Okay? I'm Reverend Marie Alfred Harkey, and today I'm the face of America. I'm Bruce Knotts, and today I am the face of America. I'm Pastor Dave Watson, and today I am the face of America. I'm Beth Harbison, and today I am the face of America. I'm Carl Morrell, and today I'm the face of America. My name is Marie Alfred Harkey. I am an ordained pastor with the Metropolitan Community Churches, which is a denomination that was founded about 50 years ago specifically to welcome gay and lesbian Christians into churches uh, because mainline churches wouldn't welcome gay and lesbian folks. It's now a denomination that welcomes LGBTQ people from around the world and also sees itself as a movement. I'm also the president of the Religious Institute, which is an organization that works for um, the liberation of bodies and spirits from oppression. We work for sexual, gender, and reproductive justice in faith communities and in society. Um, I'm an unabashed Jesus follower, and I am married to uh, the love of my life, whom I also met in seminary, um, and I am passionate about justice and in particular justice for um, s around sexuality and gender. Uh, my name is Bruce Knotts and I direct the Unitarian Universalist Office at the United Nations. I also chair the NGO DPI Executive Committee which represents 1400 NGOs at the UN. I work on the NGO Committee on uh, Sustainable Development, Human Rights, Disarmament, Peace and Security and much more. I am Dave Watson. I have the wonderful privilege of pastoring Calvary Chapel on Staten Island. I'm also the founder and president of uh, a learning institution called the New York Institute for Biblical Studies. I am the father of three amazing children. I'm a mom uh, and a wife, and I'm the director of education and teen advisor for Congregation Ahavath Beth Israel, which is um, a reform congregation, the only reform congregation here in Idaho, in Boise. My name is Carl Morell. I represent the United States Baha'i community of the United Nations. I'm a native New Yorker. I'm also on the governing council of the New York City Baha'i community. And um, it's good to be here and talk to everyone about the future of humanity. Mass exodus from the church, the percentage of young adults with no religious affiliation has nearly quadrupled since 1986. And they bring in the video games, they bring in the slime fights, they bring in the paintball, and no one wants to go to the church because they're not churches, they're social clubs. I think religion is capable of doing very much good. There are lots of hospitals and schools and other projects that, that are faith-based. Religion also does a lot of harm. I'm a gay man and I feel that religion has done a lot of harm to the LGBTQI community and it's done harm to other people, to other religious groups. So, and I've tried my entire life to balance the good against the bad and I cannot come up with a decisive decision. I think religion does a lot of good and a lot of harm and I hope religion will try to do more good than harm. At the age of 14 years uh, old, I came to a personal faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. When I came to think through what he had done for me, I thought, what, what, what better thing could I do with my life than tell others about Christ? And if I could do it full time, that would be absolutely unbelievable. God has given me that opportunity. Um, and I basically, because my life has been impacted by Christ, I seek to help others find him and be impacted in a similar manner. I was a high school teacher for 20 years and at, well, high school and middle school. And at some point in that journey, I became one of the advisors of the Gay Straight Alliance in my large public high school. And at that point, I started hearing the stories, firsthand stories from students of how they were coming out as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, um, whatever their identity might be, and being told by their families and their churches that they were not okay, um, that they were going to hell. 
And at that time, the faith that I knew was nothing like that. The Christian faith that I knew was a welcoming faith, was a faith that said that all of us are created in the image of God. And it became increasingly intolerable for me to see people being harmed by religion. And I wanted something to be different. And that's really a huge part of my call story, watching people be harmed and knowing that that, at least for me, was not the heart of what faith means and what it is. Um, and so um, in what some folks call the mother of all midlife crises, I quit my job in my 40s and uh, sold my house and went to seminary, um, not really knowing what would come next. I identify as a Democrat. I am, I, I don't like um, much of what's happening today. Um, I think people tend to look at Jews and see that we're all pro everything that Israel is doing, and I'm not. Um, many of us are not. I don't want to speak for others, but I know that there are many, many of us who agree with that. But it's no different really from being um, a United States citizen and not liking what's happening in our government, not liking some of our policies. Uh, I think that's the best analogy that I can make. Um, it does bother me that um, the left of my party um, crosses that line because, for example, the BDS movement, I, I'm, I'm opposed to it. Um, I don't think that we can say that it's the same thing as what South African apartheid was. It's very different. Um, I have lived in Israel. I've traveled there relatively recently, and it is different. I do think that there are very serious wrongs, um, but um, I don't think that the nuances of the left or the, the nuances of the issue are understood by the left of the party. The Baha'i faith began in the mid-1800s, and it's a movement about the unification of humanity. And, you know, I think that we are all striving for unity, but what often happens is we're striving for unity for our own group, our own kind, our own uh, set, if you will. So. The Baha'i faith is looking for the unity of all humanity to see themselves as one human family and to take these differences which are so common away and provide for justice and equality. Yeah, so we just adopted this beautiful vision statement that says that we recognize that as an organization it's our responsibility, it's our goal to liberate bodies and spirits from oppression. And we say that because we realize that oppression happens in people's bodies, of course. It happens because people are perhaps gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer, because they're black, because they're immigrants, because any number of things. But oppression also happens in faith communities, especially around sexuality and gender. And so this lofty vision is for a world where everybody's bodies and spirits are completely liberated. And we do that work by working for sexual, gender, and reproductive justice in faith communities um, and in society. And in faith communities particularly because especially for, especially around issues of sexuality and gender, that's where a lot of the harm has occurred. And we truly believe that faith and religion can also be a force for healing. And indeed, at their best, they are a force for healing and good and justice in the world. And so that's what we try to enact in every part and every program that we do and every part of our work. We are a faith. Uh, we actually are two faiths, the Unitarians and the Universalists that joined in 1961. We're a very liberal, progressive faith both faiths are pretty much considered heretics by the Christians. The Unitarians believe in the, in the unity of God uh, and therefore we don't necessarily accept the divinity of Jesus Christ in the way many Christians do. The Universalists believe that God uh, is merciful and kind and therefore there, no one is going to be uh, sent to hell and damnation forever. So the joke I like to tell is that we Unitarians feel that we're too good to go to hell and the Universalists feel that God is too good to send anybody to hell. New York is the, is the capital of abortion in America. One in, in every three pregnancies in New York State ends in abortion. New York City is the capital of New York when it comes to abortion. It's hard to imagine this. I was born in Southern California. 
Um, when I was 16, I went to live in Israel for several years. Um, I came back um, to California, um, but I've lived in Idaho and in New York City um, and in North Carolina. So I've been a bit all over the place. Currently, I'm following two tracks primarily, and they are the role of men in the advancement of women and the status of black folks in America through the lens of the United Nations Decade for People of African Descent. My parents actually weren't terribly religious, but I grew up in the South, in the southern part of the United States, and so religion is just sort of in the ethos, right? The, the question isn't, do you go to church, but where do you go to church? And so, from a young age, I was involved in church at some, some level, and at about the age of 13, I became very committed to Christianity. Um, in my understanding at that time, um, I was born again. Um, into this very sort of evangelical, um, conservative Christian faith, which was really all there was in, in my part of the world at that time. Um, and so it, it was this haven for me, this place where I was completely accepted, where there was unconditional love, where I had sort of found my tribe and nobody cared if um, I didn't have the latest style clothes or you know didn't look like everybody else. And it was only later that I started chafing against that particular brand of religion because I was consistently being asked to sort of check my brain at the door, not ask too many questions, um, not use my reason and my intellect. And that felt a little bit dishonest to me. And so by the time I went to college, I had sort of abandoned faith entirely. I'm married to the most wonderful man in the world. He's an African-American. He works New York Fashion Week. And um, I, I see as a couple, a couple of things. First of all, I have, we have experienced homophobia, which is very painful, but also he is a black man, uh, experiences a lot of racism, and I am there to witness that. And I hate both of those kinds of bigotries. In fact, I hate all kinds of bigotry. It's wrong, and we need to get rid of it. We, there's way too much of it in America and in the world. And so I've dedicated my life and my work to eliminating bigotry in all of its forms. If a child can come out of a womb and be left to die, how am I to tell a teenager, a teenager who doesn't want a child, how am I to tell her you had the baby in the bathroom and you drowned it in the toilet, how am I to tell her that's wrong? She doesn't see the difference. And she doesn't see the difference because there is no difference. There is a history before my time. Um, I moved to Idaho in um, the late 80s. Um, and just prior to my coming, there was uh, a bomb at, uh, planted in um, one of the, our synagogues. And um, there, is in Northern Idaho, there was in northern Idaho an outpost of, um, I believe they were Aryan nations affiliated with, a, I forget the exact name, it, was a, it had a church name. Um, but, um, and while when you look at maps of anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic acts, there are still um, locations in primarily northern Idaho where that supposedly those um, like-minded people associate. But I have not had any anti-Semitic acts. Um, there are... Um, very recently, um, Nazi symbols, symbols of um, white nationalist organizations have appeared in Boise. Um, we work closely with um, the other minority communities um, and share information because it's not just against Jews. Um, but I haven't personally experienced that. I will say that um, as a state, there is an attempt. Boise is a um, a melting pot. There are many, many more people in a more diverse community in Boise than other places, um, and so there's an effort to be sensitive um, to that variety. I think we're still behind. Uh, having lived in New York City, of course, um, and other places, there is um, uh, a mis there are just there's ignorance around um, Judaism in particular. So my stu my kids who are you know, in, in public schools, have teachers who don't always understand um, who, you know, uh, it's not anti-Semitism, but they'll say, we're going to celebrate Christmas, and we'll have secret Santas, and of course, we don't celebrate Christmas. Um, Since the beginning of time, this, this uh, umbrella of patriarchy, which hangs over humanity, 
So what we do, the men who work on it, is we first we work on ourselves and we try to see the world differently. We uh, are we check ourselves and our and our uh, rigorous in our um, evaluation of our behavior, and then we can go out and talk to men. What I find in this work is that a lot of men have never, because patriarchy is such, and it, uh, it's everywhere, we, they, a lot of men have never even had to give it a thought. I was with a group of men yesterday who were here in Brooklyn who were talking about this idea of patriarchy and how it affects everything we do, the way that we think, our relationships with women and men. So this is a long-term issue to be worked on and everything needs to change. Us as individuals, the institutions we inhabit, the communities we belong to, and the relationships we have with each other. I think bisexuality makes people uncomfortable because it moves us beyond binaries. So as I was writing this work and beginning to get in touch with my own bisexual identity, what I realized was that early on, when I came out as a lesbian in the Midwest in the early 90s, bisexual was used as a slur in my community. Um, and I think it's because there's a lot of complexity. If a person can be bisexual, then dividing people into two categories, either gay, lesbian, or straight, doesn't work so well anymore. And I think that's frightening for queer people as well as straight people. Um, the gift, however, of delving into the complexity of sexuality beyond binaries is that contemplating that kind of complexity and that kind of um, complicated interplay of people's romantic, erotic, and affectionate attractions also invites us into contemplating the complexity of what the divine might be in the world. Um, you know, Christians, we talk about how we can never fully know God. Um, and I think that that's also true about fully understanding something as complicated as human sexuality. And those two things for me are really meaningful ways to, to contemplate what is this divine and beautiful and really uh, unending complexity about both human, humanity and what I call God. I'm very proud of, of most of the work that I did as a diplomat. Probably the work that I did that I'm the most proud is working with refugees in West Africa. And, and I felt that I had done a, a lot of work to help refugees. Probably the moment that I hated the most, I was the deputy chief of mission at our embassy in the Gambia. The ambassador was gone, so I was the acting ambassador. And I received a message from Washington, D.C. telling me to go into the government and to tell them they must immediately pass legislation to indemnify Americans from ever facing prosecution at the International Criminal Court, or we were going to cut off all economic assistance to this very poor country. I did as I was instructed. They passed the legislation as requested, so it was a success, but I felt physically sick about it. Uh, today at the United Nations, I very much promote the International Criminal Court, and I hope the United States signs the Rome Statute and participates in this very important human rights court. The New York State Legislature doesn't write their bills. In the state of New York, the lobbyists write the bills and the legislatures put their stamp on it. Since about 1996, uh, 97, I'm sorry, 2006, 2007, uh, the state assembly has taken up this bill and then it gets defeated in the Senate, it gets defeated because it's just a horrible bill. Um, it, 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 it basically allows you to deliver a child and leave it to die. It also does not protect the baby in the womb. If, you know, in our case, where, where we are, you know, we know of experiences where drug dealers have uh, punched a woman in the stomach with the intent of causing an abortion or taking the woman to, uh, you know, a spontaneous abortion or taking a woman uh, to an abortion clinic and made her have an abortion. You know, the real world is that now that child has no protection inside the womb. If the drug dealer wants to do that, he doesn't face, uh, a tr uh, other than an assault on the woman, he doesn't face uh, charges for what he just did uh, to the baby. 
we are diverse in our um, congregants. We have um, LGBT uh, community, transgender. Uh, I want to emphasize that also is accepted in our community and embraced. Um, we there are various religi religious um, approaches to why we practice as we do and how we um, uh, are broad in our interpretation of what Judaism should and could be. Um, my understanding of orthodoxy, and so I hate to speak for them, I have had exposure both locally and in New York, but they interpret um, halakha, which are the laws, um, in a more um, conservative, um, one might say traditional view, or uh, the what it says is what it is, and that's from Talmud, not just from the Bible, that our the Talmud is our um, body of laws. And we have a more open interpretation, uh, a more contemporary and progressive looking um, presentation, uh, so that um, it, it encompasses um, changing notions of Judaism. The thing that I'm beginning to wonder about with my colleagues is how do we embrace two, for some seemingly uh, opposite values of justice and unity? How do we achieve justice for all, but yet remain unified as a global human family? It's not easy. The feelings are tender the hurt and injustice is long-standing so how do we take steps to not just uh, avoid what is happening now but to look deeply into what are the root causes not only with the human beings but with the societal institutions that uh, allow this behavior to flourish in such a long-standing way. Religious traditions throughout time have had differing views on when life begins, on abortion, on contraception. Our position at the Religious Institute is that it is up to a person to make that decision for themselves with their own faith community, their own faith commitments, or their own values. Um, but it is not up to anyone else to tell a person what to do. One of the highest values that we hold is that human being, or that I hold at least as a Christian, is that human beings have free will. And free will is difficult. Free will means that we have to grapple with moral decisions. And in that grappling, I think we find our own moral center. And it's just not for anyone else to tell a person what that moral center should be. There are as many different views on abortion and contraception, I dare say, as there are people. But each person should be and must be allowed to make those decisions based on their own convictions in conversation with their faith, with their family, with their community, with their own values. And that is that moral reckoning and wrestling is where each person's relationship with their inmost values comes. And to deny people that relationship, to say that they don't deserve the chance to, to do their own moral work around such an important decision, is to deny their moral agency and their own tenets of their faith. And, it, and to me, it is a contradiction of my faith to impose whatever my beliefs might be on someone else. The sad truth of the fact that the Democratic Party is very much uh, in bed with Planned Parenthood and NARAL is that, truthfully, follow the money. It's about funding. It's about money. It's about political correctness. If members of the, of the, of the Democratic Party were to pull their support for, say, Planned Parenthood. Well, Planned Parenthood has an arm of it that is giving campaign contributions. If, 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 if they were to push back on NARAL, uh, the National uh, Abortion Rights League, they would lose their funding. Uh, they would lose their funding sources. I don't think that as a whole, individuals, and surveys show us this, individuals believe there ought to be abortion on demand up until the last seconds of the ninth month. 
I don't think, you know, surveys don't show that to be the case. It's not representative of the people, even in a state that's liberal like New York. But our politicians, because in some ways, this is hard to say, but it's the truth, abortion is sacrosanct. It's almost a sacrament. And Planned Parenthood and NARAL are almost the priestesses, uh, high priestesses of, of, of this sacrament. And our politicians need to at least bow down to them or they're gonna, they're gonna face terrible consequences. I don't think I would be the person that I am if I was not gay. My parents were, were very right-wing Republicans, very religious people. I think if I had been born straight, I probably would follow, have followed in their footsteps. But because I was born gay, and because they did not accept my sexual orientation, that caused me to question all of their values, to question everything, to, to question my religion, to question politics. And so it has made me a questioner. And I hope everybody will be questioners. Question everything. Uh, I think just to accept everything that's given to you in childhood is, is wrong. You need to ask your own questions, and, and that's what I did. And I came up with very different um, answers than, than my parents had, because I couldn't accept what my parents were saying, that I was not a worthy person because of my sexual orientation. So that caused me to question everything. It is clear we are all here in one space, planet Earth, and how much better is it when, when we all work together? We've all had opportunities to work on projects of various kinds, and it is always a better experience when people work together. And it's always uh, so challenging and fatiguing when there is disunity and people do not pull for each other. Well, you can't separate morality from public policy. I can't say, well, you know what? I'm against murder, but I could see where it might work for you. I can't do that. So I, I take, a, 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 uh, I take my, my, my thinking from John the Baptist. John the Baptist saw that Herod had a moral problem. He was living or was marrying uh, in an, almost an ancestral relationship, his, his brother's uh, wife. It was just not right. So John the Baptist said, that's wrong. Well, Herod didn't appreciate that and John lost his head. But John didn't hesitate to speak to that political issue. So I, I, I try not to, to, to endorse a candidate or a group of candidates or a party, but I am gonna speak to the issues. If you want to know why someone could support Trump, and I, I've written in some ways against the man. I had a, a very large piece called um, Trumping uh, the Beatitudes on Super Tuesday because he, he doesn't embody those Beatitudes. But if you want to know why someone could support him, it's because he's going to appoint judges who are going to make the abortion laws stricter. We're just tired of having babies aborted. Uh, we're not comfortable with that. And um, therefore, we're, a lot, we're, we're willing to swallow uh, some, of the, some of the crud that, that is, comes out of the Donald's tweets in order, to, in order to accomplish that goal. I think that what's happening around LGBTQ rights in this country is a little scary at this point. Actually, it's a lot scary. Um, what we're seeing, and even more than the Masterpiece case, which I will touch on, even more than that, we're seeing rollbacks of trans, of, of protections for transgender people in schools and public accommodations. And that, because transgender folks are so marginalized and so at risk, I think that that is even more frightening to me than what's happening in a case like Masterpiece, for example. But I think the overall sense for us as queer people that we're sort of moving backwards is real. And all of us, no matter how many different identities intersect in our bodies, are carrying fear about that and are carrying anxiety about that. The Masterpiece case in particular is an odd piece of jurisprudence, I would say. Um, on the one hand, right, it did narrowly rule in favor of the baker, but on the other hand, what it didn't do, and, and the ju justices were very clear in this opinion, was that it did not give people, a right, businesses, a right to discriminate based on sexual orientation. It ruled very narrowly that the, that the Colorado Civil Rights Commission had been hostile to religion based on some comments that were recorded. Um, what I do know 
is that the attacks aren't over, that they're going to continue, that Supreme Court cases around LGBTQ rights, justice, discrimination are going to continue to come up, and that those of us who believe deeply that each and every person has dignity and worth in this society are going to have to keep up the work that we're doing um, so that our rights don't continue to be rolled back.